and he doesn't go for Hajj. And this whole time, he's been procrastinating. Tomorrow, the day after, tomorrow, the day after, Bukra Ba'din. Tayyib. Yani, we should be aware of this reality. There's no such thing. The righteous predecessors, one of them will enter the masjid huh, for Salat al -Zuhur. And in his mind, in his mind, he does not think he will make it back for Asr. That's how they used to think. He comes into the masjid, this is my last Salah. This could be my last Salah. That, that would, that's it. This is how their attitude was. There's no tomorrow. There's no next week. There's no next year. Let alone after I do Hajj. And the brother is 20, you know, 15 years old. Says, when I do Hajj, Inshallah, I will repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is from the tricks of the shaitan. Continue to uh, procrastinate is something that a Muslim should not have. Allah gave you the power. Allah gave you the ability. Allah gave you the strength. Yalla. Ala tool, you do it. Ala tool, now that you can. Later on, the situation may change. You may be healthy today, ill tomorrow. You may be wealthy today, poor tomorrow. You may be capable today, incapable tomorrow. You may be alive today, dead tomorrow. So this is a fact. You see it. Every day in your life people die. And it could be you next day, next time. So then one must prepare. From now, you don't leave alone things you're supposed to do. And you don't do things that you're not supposed to do on the premise that, Wallah, later. When the situation change, make dua for me. That's the only answer you get. Ya akhi, by the way, what you're doing is wrong. He make dua for me. Ya akhi, you make dua for you. You don't depend on me to make dua for you, for Allah to guide you. Allah did not say that. Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Those who strive in our cause, we will guide them to the path. The one who strives, not the one who someone else makes dua for. Not that making dua is not good, but don't depend on that. People depend on that. They see you, they think you're righteous. Say, Akhi, make dua for me and for my children. Akhi, raise yourself and your children. And I will make dua, for, not me, yani the one who he's speaking to. Then the person will make dua for you, inshallah. And you may think he's good, and maybe in the sight of Allah, he is nothing. You may be better in the sight of Allah than him. So you fix your own family, fix your own self. Don't depend on people's dua. It is only a bonus, not, not, the, not the main salary. It's a bonus that you get if someone, a righteous sheikh, righteous scholar, you know, not the average person you meet in the masjid, makes dua for you, alhamdulillah. People used to seek Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, to make dua for their, you know, for their family members, because he was a righteous man. His dua was accepted. But they did not make their objective of life, wallah, seeking Imam Ahmad for dua, to supplicate, yani, for them. Rather, they strove, and this is only a bonus. So this is something that we must be mindful of. Uh, thirdly, being conceited. Yani, thinking that you are a big shot. And the way we, I, you know, we try to use it is, if you think that you are good, that means you're not good. Pay attention. If you think you've made it, خلاص, you're, you're, you are yani, taqi, that means you're not. And if you feel that you have not made it, that means inshallah probably you are. That's how it works. You see, it's the other way around. And the evidence for that is the Quran, the Sunnah, and the lives of the Sahaba of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You look at them, you read their biography, you will think that these people, if you did not know how righteous they were, you will think that they are the most evil people in the world because of how scared they are of Allah, how scared they are of the punishment, how concerned they are about whether they will be among the believers. One of the uh, Tabi'in said, I met over 28 of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu each one of them thought that he was a hypocrite. The Sahabi, he thinks he's a hypocrite. Why? Because they were righteous. And the hypocrite thinks that he's righteous. The real hypocrite is the one that he thinks he's already righteous. So this is from the tricks of the shaitan. Don't believe, don't think that you've made it, akhi, or ukhti. You have not. We have not made it. We are far away. Far away from them. And far away from righteousness of the righteous people today. And I'm not generalizing, there may be people amongst us who have made it. But for the average one of us, this is not the case. So don't think that you are Shaykh al-Islam because if you have done some acts of worship or you have done some good deeds, that means that you've already, wallah, you're successful. You're on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You must have the two wings. As the scholars put it, the believer travels to Allah like a bird with two wings. Khawf and raja, fear and hope. If you have one more than the other, you will crash. If you have too much hope, huh, and not enough fear of Allah, you will not make it. Too much fear of Allah, not enough hope, you will not make it. You must be balanced. And that indicates that you will not be conceited.
Because if you can see that, that means you're not badass. You already think, well, Allah, khalas, I am it. The opposite of that is fake modesty. Yani, someone tries to be very modest to the extent that they leave alone the obligations and the, uh, the obligations and the prohibitions they commit them. An example, a classical example. Someone sees an evil being committed in his presence. And the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ رَأَ مِنْكُمْ مُنْكَرًا فَلِغَيِّرْهُ بِيَدِهِ فَأَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِلِسَانِهِ فَأَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِقَلْبِهِ وَذَلِكَ أَضْعَفُ الْإِيمَانِ Whoever amongst you sees an evil, let him change it with his hand. If you have the authority to do so. You may be the father in the house and you see something wrong, you handle business like a man, as a man of the house. A woman sees her children, she has authority over them, she will also handle business with her hand. Because Prophet said this is the first option. If you're unable to do that because of the circumstances, then you speak against it. And if for whatever reason you're unable to do that, then you disagree with your heart, but that's the weakest of faith. The Prophet made a comment at the end, this is the weakest of faith. طيب. You see someone doing munkar, huh? and you know that this is wrong. The shaitan will come and tell you, Listen, you're not a da'iyah, you're not a student of knowledge, you're not a sheikh, a scholar. You don't go advise this person, huh? Out of your modesty is know who you are. You're nothing. So leave him alone. So you see the munkar and you don't do anything. Why? Because the shaitan told you, you're not qualified. You're not qualified to speak, you have very little knowledge, so be quiet. And this is called fake modesty. This is the kind of modesty that you don't need. Rather, what you're supposed to do is depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and go and advise him. If you have knowledge of the thing and it's not something that is, يعني, the scholars have differed about or you're trying to impose your opinion about him, uh, on him, excuse me, there are things that are clear in the deed. Then you must go and advise and leave alone this fake modesty that, wallah, I am not qualified, so no da'wah. You see, you work with a non-Muslim for 15 years. You never tell him anything about Islam. Why? Wallah, I'm not a da'ya. The da'wah is for, you know, this uh, da'ya such and such, and Mr. such and such, and Dr. such and such. But for me, akhi, I'm an average Muslim. I cannot do this. And akhi say, this is wrong. Everyone is supposed to give da'wah according to your ability. Do you need to go to school to learn how to hand over a book or a pamphlet to a non-Muslim? Huh? Is it something that you have to graduate with, with a PhD? How to hand over a pamphlet? You know, they have classes, you know. They have a doctor showing you, you know, how the elbow moves. This is how you give an unmuslim a pamphlet. Have you ever been to any of these classes? No! You grab it, say tfaddal, with a smile. That's it! You don't need any knowledge to give da'wah. If you have more knowledge, barakallah, you grab him, say, listen, let me tell you about Islam, and you explain Islam. If you're unable to do that, then there's a minimum, minimum requirement, which is conveying the message of Islam to these people. And that, the shaitan will tell you, you're not a da'iyah. So leave that alone. So you work with an non-Muslim all your life and he never hears anything about Islam. And we've met these people at the Dawah Center. We get traumatized at the Dawah Center. You have a, a, a person coming. He said, I've been working here for 18 years. No one told me about Islam. 18 years? 18 years. That's a whole lifetime. No one ever told him about Islam until one month before him coming to us. Someone told him about Islam. In one month, Allah guided him. Subhanallah. So this is a shortcoming that we have. You do something for the sake of Allah. Don't let the shaitan fool you that you're not qualified. No, you are qualified, inshallah. But if you want to speak about, you know, the divinity of Jesus and you don't have knowledge about that, then you leave that alone. Then you leave that alone. This is how you are being modest, where you don't go into things that you have no knowledge of. Otherwise, there's a minimum requirement that the shaitan will try to fool you by telling you, stay modest. Don't enter into this business so you will leave alone the evil and you will never forbid it and then you will be among those who are tricked by the shaitan.